But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to each, and to each his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest, coming suddenly, he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Uh, we certainly want to say welcome to anyone who is watching via YouTube. And it is a continual um, encouragement to see a number of people who, who watch uh, the talks uh, here at, uh, in Rosington on, on a regular basis. And as always, you'd be very welcome to, to come along if you're in the area, uh, half past 10 at the Homescar Center here right next to ASDA. We're going to come to this portion in Mark chapter 13. And we're going to sort of entitle this Incredible Things to Come. Uh, last week, we, we looked at the first part, from verses 1 through 13, and let me just kind of sort of recap and just make an, an additional comment or two. Uh, we've looked at so many things all throughout the book of Mark for, for a number of weeks now, some amazing things, and we're just now coming up to the time when we're going to be facing uh, the crucifixion and all those uh, uh, ending, vent, uh, ending events as we come to the end of the book of Mark. Now we're going to have a little bit of a different game plan on what we're going to do uh, over the next weeks. But uh, the point is that Jesus gives in Mark chapter 13 some words, his parting words, the cross is coming soon, but he speaks about things that are going to be happening in the future. Anytime we talk about prophecy, future things, as we mentioned last week, it can become an incredibly <laughs> heated debate. And I'm not sure why that is. It could be that people who maybe are so passionate about this, and because of its being prophecy, it's things that have not happened yet, and a lot of it is pictures and things that could be taken one way or another, and, but the, the problem is sometimes people can be so confident of their understanding on how things are going to happen that two people sometimes sort of butt heads. Now, I don't know if, you know, if there's anyone, and, and, your, and prophecy is one of your passions, that's, perfect, that's wonderful. As a matter of fact, um, to the best of my knowledge, the book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible that we're actually promised a blessing if we read it. So it is a blessing. Uh, I've, read, I've heard interesting stories of new believers who, uh, who sort of approach the Bible and say, where do I start? What do I do? How do I sort of understand you know, this whole thing of the Bible? And they say, well, you know what? You know, when you come to a novel and you want to find out who done it, what do you do? You go to the and, and you figure out who done it. And they said, well, I'll go to Revelation and find out who done it. And, and they said, oh no, what am I going to do now? Uh, it is, it can be very, very confusing. It can be quite a challenge. And I can appreciate uh, the, the complexity and the difficulty. Now, Jesus is going to be dealing with some things. And I will say straight out that I don't claim to be an expert in these things of prophecy. I have my own thoughts. I have my own opinions, but if your opinions differ than mine in these sort of specific things, that is just fine, okay? We don't have to be upset with one another. It has happened in the past, and we certainly don't want to see that happen, but we want to be able to agree on the main things that Jesus is speaking of, because here's the reality. When God gave his word, it's not a problem about God's Word. It's far more a problem with people. Because anytime something wants to be communicated, there's all kinds of layers of stuff you kind of have to work through. Has anyone ever had an email or a text or a message of some sort 
been misunderstood. Yeah, everyone can shake your head along like this, of course. Same thing can happen with the Bible multiplied by a million. I remember back in the early days when Doreen, who normally sits right there, bless her heart, she had no idea even how to text. So Doreen got one of these little, you know, little Nokia. Remember the old phones that you can only text on and none, none of these little, none of this sort of uh, pictures and all sort of things. So she got this phone and she was so excited because she could now text. But every text that she sent me was on caps, on capitals. She, yeah, she, yeah, she didn't realize that, you know, the hidden message behind capitals is that you are shouting to the other person. So she didn't realize that. So her intent was not to shout, but when I received it, Doreen, what did I do? I, I mean, I'm so sorry. I mean, and she didn't realize that. So many miscommunications, many misunderstandings, many hurt feelings, probably even a relationship has been busted up because of misunderstanding texts and various things like that. The same thing can happen in God's Word. The writers had certainly, and Jesus as he spoke, certainly had very specific things in mind as they spoke, and the writers as they recorded all these things, very specific things in mind. Our challenge is this. We live in the 21st century, in our context in England. We understand how things work. However, when this was written, we're talking 2,000 years ago, an entirely different culture, an entirely different context. Our job is to do the best that we can to understand that and to take ourselves to that time and see the history surrounding all that's happening and to try and get our head around what Jesus is speaking about. So having said that, I'm going to do the very best that I can, and let's see if we can suss some of this out. And we want to hit the main points to try and see what Jesus is trying to tell us. So we're going to break this up into roughly three sections, and we're going to sort of go through this, and we want to hit the highlights. We want to see uh, and focus on what we know. We're going to talk about some things that we don't know for sure, but we'll just kind of highlight them to show you some of the issues that there could be out there. So in verses 14 through 23, we're going to talk about a time of turning up the heat, turning up the heat, verses 14 through 23. And let me just read this to you. Remember, Jesus got done speaking about uh, that first section, verses 1 through 13, and he continues on these concepts as we move on. Verse 14 says this. So, when you see the abomination of desolation, and that's a big phrase, and anytime you talk to people who are, who have this, who, who are very strong on you know, the whole prophecy thing, this phrase will come up. And then the question is, what does this phrase mean? Spoken of, in verse 14, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Say, uh, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter uh, to take anything out of the house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Isn't that interesting? But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in the winter. For in those days there shall be tribulation, such as not, uh, has not been since the beginning of the creation, which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord has shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. For the elect's sake, even whom, uh, whom he chose, he shortened the days. Verse 21. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is there. Do not believe it. You remember last time, last Sunday, we talked about, Jesus said several times, do not be, what was the word? Deceived. deceived. Well done, Caroline. Do not be deceived. Verse 22. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed. See, I've told you all these things beforehand. We could spend, and people have spent, hours and hours and hours on that particular section. We are not going to do that. We're going to hit what I'm going to call just the highlights. So here we go. This thing of the abomination of desolation. 
a phrase that has been bantered about, talked about so much. So let's just ask the question. There's a couple of questions that pop up straight away. First of all, what could be? What in the world is this particular thing called the abomination of desolation? And what, uh, what's, what's the whole idea about it? Well, Jesus does mention this. And he actually mentions that uh, it's, it's spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And if you want to turn there, we won't turn there for time right now, but you can just reference it if I didn't put it in your notes. Daniel 9.27, it is mentioned. But there again, there is a, 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 another uh, portion within the Gospels. Remember, we have four Gospels. There are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each one of them will have uh, very similar sorts of things, but also complementary and parallel sorts of things. Luke uh, actually says that Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies and talks about this great blasphemy, this great thing that will be happening. So now the question is, what could it be? If you remember last time, last week, do you remember we talked about the Jewish war? You remember about, we, we talked about the time when uh, that the Romans had come had surrounded and had built that siege around Jerusalem. And do you remember the name of the second command? Starts with a T. Actually, his name is actually a book in the Bible as well. Not Timothy. It was Titus. Okay, Titus. And it wasn't the Bible writer, by the way. <laughs> it was a, it was a, it was a Roman who led the army. And one thing happened after another that uh, through a series of three months of battles and skirmishes and, and many, many people dying, the Romans finally entered the temple area and to show his victory, do you remember what Titus did? He sacrificed a pig on the Jewish altar as an ultimate slam in the face of everything that the Jews stood for as far as their worship. And with, with sacrificing that pig, he declared, we are victors, we have overcome you. Now, someone could say, this portion, this, this, this prophecy in Daniel, speaking of the abomination of desolation, uh, could be referring to that time in the year 70 AD, when this actually happened. And as we said, Luke spoke about uh, armies surrounded Jerusalem, which is exactly what happened. So it could be referring to that. Also, there is someone else called Antiochus IV. Now, once you get into sort of ancient history, the names are weird, as we mentioned last time. But let me just give you the quick one, two, three about this chappy. So he was actually before Titus. He was 167 BC, so before Christ. His name was actually Theos Epiphanes. Okay, for anyone who is familiar, Theos, do you know what name or what word that refers to? That's the Greek word for God. Epiphanes uh, talks about coming or shown. So he took the name Theos Epiphanes to illustrate that he is God appearing. Isn't that lovely? Okay, this is this particular chapter. He was against the Jewish worship as it happened the Jews didn't like him. They revolted. Antiochus set up what I'm going to call a puppet high priest. And he was meant to do whatever Antiochus wanted him to wanted, wanted done against what the Jewish worship was. The Jews revolted. They battled. He heard about it. He returned. And he ended up killing many thousands of Jews. In revenge against their revolt. He then offered a pig on the altar to show that he was in power, but not only that, he even took it a step further. He forced the Jews to eat the meat from the pig and to bow down to him. So, people would point to Antiochus IV or to Titus and say, this is the one that Jesus was speaking of. But then there could, all, there could become all kinds of questions. Well, since something that could fit into Jesus' description happened twice already, is it possible that it could happen again 
later on down the road? And the answer is, of course it could. Of course it could. And this is some of the issues and the problems and the questions that come up. Because the second question that ties into the first is, well, when is this going to be? Was it in 167 BC? Was it in 70 AD? Or is there another part of the timetable that's going to be tied into that with the return of Jesus? I wish I could answer all of those questions for you in absolute certainty, but I can't. So, I do want to bring this out, though. With all, the, with, with all the, the questions and with all the uncertainties, here's what we do know. Here's what we do know. If you look at verse 19, if you look at verse 19, let me, let me look at that again real quick. It's Jesus speaking. It says, For in those days there will be tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of creation, which God created until this time, or ever shall be. So the point is, in verse 19, it's going to be, make sure I get there, intense. Whether Jesus was talking about something that has already happened in history, or quite possibly another time of tribulation that Jesus could be speaking about. And if you look into the book of Revelation, there are incredible incredibly intense times of tribulation. If you study into the book of Daniel, there are incredibly intense times of tribulation and trouble and suffering. And Jesus said, those times that he's talked about will be unparalleled. And the point is this. And I don't think we should gloss over this. And this is important. Because this world is a broken world, Suffering and tribulation and problems and troubles are part and parcel to who we are as people. Throughout this last two years, and even recently, you know, we've tried to help and encourage people who have lost family and death. And death is so painful. Death is so... You know, we were never, des the, the reality is we need to remember, we were never designed to die. God did not, God did not, when he created Adam and Eve, said, okay, right, I'm going to give them, oh, I don't know, uh, 125 years, some kind of number, well, pick a number, and say after that, then, then that'll be it. God designed his creation to last forever. But the problem is that this sin that crept into the Garden of Eden, which now we have. And because of that, that's the reason we have the suffering and the troubles and all the things that we look around the world. And, we, and the question is, how can there be a loving God when I see all the stuff that's happened? Now, I, I'm not going to say that there's a, a simple, pat, two-second answer to all those incredibly complex, difficult questions. But I can say that trouble and suffering and difficulties are part of this world because of the reality of what sin is and the effects that sin is. Jesus said that there will be this time of suffering, this time of tribulation unparalleled. And he said, actually in verse 19, and this is, this is, what, this is what brings up a bunch of, a bunch of questions. He said that the time that I'm speaking of, there, up until that time and even beyond that time, that particular uh, time period, will, there'll be suffering unparalleled. So what, ex what exact time period is Jesus speaking about? It almost points into some time in the future. But we're not going to debate that at this point. But it is going to be intense. It is going to be intense or was intense. But then in verse 15 and 16, it says it's going to be quite the dramatic, immediate sort of thing. Notice, look at the words that he says. He says, he says uh, when this abomination of desolation, when this event happened that's spoken by Daniel, whether then it was something that happened in 167 BC, whether it was 70 AD or sometime in the future, Jesus says this, let him who's on the housetop not even go down into the house or enter to take anything out of his house. Goodness. I mean, I mean, if there's trouble coming, what's your first response? What do you do? 
Well, you run into your house and you, you maybe grab your passport or your, you grab you know, some bits and pieces that, that, that are very precious to you, maybe some pictures or whatever, and then you pack up a bag and then that's what it does in movies anyway, right? They pack up a quick bag and, and then they're off. Jesus said, no, 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 no. Listen, if even if you're on the top of the housetop, and then people would tend to have relax on top of the housetop, you know, not, not for us, but that's what, that's what they did in that time. And then he was in the field, don't even go back and get his clothes. Don't he, Jesus said, when that time comes, if you're out working in the field, don't even worry about going back and getting your clothes. Get out of there, move, get away. But woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies. I pray that your flight may not be in the winter because you're not going to go back and get some more clothes. Jesus said, it's going to be immediate, it's going to be sudden, all these things are going to be happening. But then he said, as we mentioned before, that there's going to be false teachers who will continue to appear. False teachers will continue to appear. We looked at this last time and we mentioned the likes of David Koresh. We mentioned the likes of Sun, Sun Young Moon, if you remember those couple of names. And we said that also in this world, Certainly since Jesus' time and all throughout the history in these last 2,000 years, false teachers have appeared. They are part and parcel of, who, uh, of, of this current system. So there is that incredibly intense time. But then we're going to look at this next section. We're just going to call this the return of Jesus. The return of Jesus. Let me get this up. There we go. The return of Jesus. Verses 24 through 31. 24 through 31. This gets a bit more intense. But in those days, in those days, but then he says, after that tribulation, Eric, what tribulation are you talking about? That's the question. Is there a further tribulation that Jesus is speaking about? I personally think so. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give us light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers in the heavens shall be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather them and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the furthest parts of earth to the furthest part of heaven. Now, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch had already become tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things will take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Now, what is Jesus speaking about here? He does say, he does say in verse 24, but in those days, after that tribulation, it's after the tribulation that he's speaking of. The question is, how far after? Exactly what tribulation is he speaking of? Those are the questions that are so much up for debate. So let's throw out these couple of things. First of all, what we don't know for sure. Now you will find people who will say, I know this for sure. And that's fine. I'm not so sure that we can be absolutely dead set on all of these things. What we don't know for sure. Number one. And you can jot these down. I didn't put them on your notes just so I wanted to focus on the things that we can try to be, you know, sort of sure about and so forth. But what we don't know, here's a couple of bits. Exactly what period of suffering Jesus is speaking about. Exactly what period of tribulation, exactly what period of suffering Jesus is talking about, I'm not sure exactly. He could be talking about sometime into the future. We don't know how long is the after, number two. Jesus said after. We don't know how long the after is. But then in verse 30, is a point of great question, great debate. Notice what it says in verse 30. It says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. He's talking about 
the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give us light, the stars of heaven will fall, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Those are pretty dramatic events, aren't they? I mean, <laughs> you don't see that every day. Pretty dramatic events. Jesus says, this generation will by no means pass away. The question is then, exactly what does this generation mean? <clears throat> there have been people who say that Jesus means it's the generation of people that he's directly speaking to. Well, if he means that, then all of those things would have already happened. And I don't think that would be the case. Is he talking about this generation, that generation who will see the stars of heaven fall and the moon turn dark and all these kind of things? Probably he's talking about that generation. Is he talking about the generation of the great tribute of this tribulation, this great suffering? These are some of the questions that get discussed at great length. Eric, which one is right? Okay, I'm simply saying, I personally think Jesus is dealing with the generation that will be seeing these things, experiencing these things. But there are many, many questions about exactly what Jesus is speaking of. And we're talking about the return of Jesus. However, here are some things that we do know. That we do know. Here we go. Number one, number one, Jesus' entrance will be sure. His entrance will be sure and dramatic. Look what it says. Look what it says. With all those events, uh, we, the, we will see, verse 26, we will see the Son of Man coming in the, crowd, in the clouds with great power and great glory. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but it's going to be a great show. It's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. Eric, will I be here to see this? Where will I be as a believer? That's another series of massive questions. The Bible does seem to indicate, and we're going to come to this in just a second, that these events could be any time. Jesus then says, number two, that, and this is what we can really hold on to, that God's word is sure. God's word is sure. In verse 31, and this has been quoted a thousand times as it's been quoted once. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, and it will. Okay? Looking into the book of Revelation, the Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth. The old ways will be swept away. God will establish everything new. Eric, what exactly does all that mean? We're going we're gonna to find out. We're going to find out. I won't be able to give you all the details. I don't know all the details. God says, this is what's going to happen. This old world with all the sin, with all the problems, with all the suffering, all those kind of things will be moved off to the side, will be done away with. But he did say that although heaven and earth are going to pass away, God's word will by no means, in no way, pass away. And you know what? That's what I hold on to. Eric, so can you give me all the details of all what's going to be happening in God's timeline? No. Are there some people who say they can? Of course there are. Are they right? Well, if you get 10 people and line them up, and you ask them, you'll probably get 10 different answers. Can they all be right? No. Is one, or one, or one, is one, or is one of them right? <laughs> probably, probably, or closer. I mean, at the end of the day, here's the thing. At the end of the day, and this is what, this is what I've come to conclude. At the end of the day, God is going to do what God's going to do. Am I going to have any real power to change it? No. Should I spend my energy fussing about it? No. I'd rather, spend my, I'd rather spend my energy, and we're going to come to this in just a few minutes, I'd rather spend my energy doing and focusing on what God wants me to focus on. And I'm not saying people who expend great amount of time and energy and study looking at prophetic events and trying to map these things out 
I'm not saying they're wasting their time or it's a bad thing. It's a very exciting thing, and I'm, and I'm very happy to, to sit down and talk about all these things. But the thing is, like I said, in my experience over the years, it seems there's one thing that believers get very agitated about is this thing of prophecy and people who don't agree with what you think about all these kind of things, and they get agitated and angry, and, and you break up fellowship, you break friends. I'm thinking, why? Why? I mean, I, I can believe that if I go north, I'll make my way to London. And I guess if you go north long enough, you'll, will you eventually get there? If you, ah, wait a minute. Then you have to go south, right? Yeah, I can think if I, if I can you know, get on the M1 and go north, that I'll eventually get to London. I can think that way, but it's not true. And God's word is true. God's word is sure. That's what we know. Whether I understand it in the way that God intended, that's the question. That's the question. And like I said, you could have 10 people up here giving you a talk about what's going to be happening, and they will sure have differences. And that's why I've enjoyed looking at some church history thing for the last 2,000 years. And my goodness, what an interesting, interesting story. And so all of these things have sort of uh, you know, people approach these things and they try to figure them out and it gets so frustrating. And so we need, our job is to try and grab the things that we know for sure and hold on to those. And the way I say to, to, to people, I say, listen, I'm happy to sit down and have a cup of coffee and talk about anything with anybody. And that's fine. And we can disagree. And, 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 uh, and But no, there, there, are some, there are some basic things within the Bible that I'm going to call the, the inner circle things. You know, the nature of God's word. God's word is sure. Okay? That's, that is non-negotiable. Non Who is Jesus? Jesus is the son of God. He is God. He was born of a virgin. He died on the cross. He rose again. Those are non-negotiable. Okay? God is a trinity. He is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Eric, how does that work? I don't know exactly. But the Bible clearly shows that it does work just because I don't understand how it works doesn't mean that it's not true. That is non-negotiable. And the way we try to draw is that sort of a, sort of a, 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 a it's target where you can shoot arrows at or whatever. It's that there's various things that are sort of inside that little circle that are non-negotiable things, but there are a number of things that are outside in those outside rings that there's room for variation, gray areas, and it could be this, it could be that, and that's okay. That's okay, because we are people. And understanding things and understanding God's word, there could be variations, and God's word could have um, space for those kinds of uh, different ways of seeing it. And we need to appreciate that and understand that as believers in those areas of gray math, those areas of gray, uh, grayness, there are variations, okay? We have to be okay with that. However, God's word is sure, and we can, and we can stand on that. There, and these events are, there's, again, as, G, as we just got done saying this last point, these are intense periods of events. Then the question comes in, Eric, are they literal? Are they figurative? Oh, that's another massive, massive area. Massive area, okay? My first inclination would be say, to say that they are, they are literal, but that's just my understanding my, the way I see this. And as we said previously, that suffering is a part of the results of sin in this world system that has rejected God. But here's the thing, here's the thing. The believer, the Christian, has something far better than this current world system. Jesus said heaven and earth are going to pass away and they will pass away. God's word is sure. And God will set up. So that is a reason, that is a hope for every believer. That the current world system and all the problems and the rubbish you see all around, one day is going to be wiped away. And God will set up something brand new. Now, we want to spend just the last few minutes together looking at this portion that Chad read from verse 32. Eric, so what have you actually given to us today? You don't, you don't seem very you know, confident in all this. Well, 
of everything that we've said so far, if you could just take away one thing, and the one thing is this, that God's word is sure. Okay? However God intended it, however God meant it, whatever God has planned, he is going to perform his plan. Just because I don't necessarily understand all the details, that's okay. That's okay. Just because I may be different than Simon or different than uh, Chris or, or whoever on some of these details, that is all right. But God's word is sure. This last part from verse 32 through verse 37, we're going to title this, Be Alert. Be Alert. Verse 32 through 37. Let's read it again. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, Jesus himself, but only the Father. Eric, is that a problem? Okay, we'll talk about that in just a second. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. Speaking of Jesus coming. It is like a man going into a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, and you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening or the morning or the crowing of the rooster or, the, or, or, uh, or, or sorry, midnight or in the crowing of the rooster or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you all, Watch or be alert. Be alert. In those few verses, the warning of being alert or watch happens three times in those few verses. The question is for, I think, each one of us. It's very easy. It's very easy. And I know because the person who struggles with it greatly is the one I look at in the mirror when I brush my teeth every morning. It's very easy to kind of get into the hamster wheel of life, right? You know what I mean by the hamster wheel of life? Uh, we had a hamster one time. I uh, can't remember what it was. He had a sort of a sad ending. <laughs> we won't go into that right now. Had something to do with the cat. And this, this hamster was in, it had this little cage thingy little plastic box, a couple little bits and pieces, and we had this little wheel, and that little guy would just get on that little wheel, and he just do, 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 do as fast, as, you, you don't even see his legs move, he was just as fast as he can go. And that wheel just turn, 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 and I'm sure he, was, he thought he was doing a great job. I mean, he was making distance. Was he going anywhere? No. He'd get an exercise, and that was good, and that was the purpose of the, of the, of, of the hamster wheel. But sometimes, sometimes, you know, us people, we can sort of get on a hamster wheel, right? We can make lots of motion, but not make any distance. And so I think, I think Jesus is kind of saying something like this. He's saying we can become spiritually asleep. We can get on sort of the hamster wheel and just kind of go through all the motions and do all the stuff. And all of a sudden you wake up. You think, what happened? Has anyone ever, you know, the whole thing of daydreaming. Has anyone ever daydreamed before? Yeah, of course we do. You're, you're there, and then all of a sudden you, you, you seem like you phase out. And someone goes like this to you, and you have no idea what's going on. And all of a sudden you, you look, and it's already half an hour's gone. And I, I enjoy reading these little things, and, and uh, there's, there's, there's a phrase called highway hypnosis. If you heard of the phrase highway hypnosis, scary. And the idea is that particularly on roads like motorways, you could be driving down the motorway and uh, because of maybe it's a long and straight uh, road, uh, you just get in your car and you just drive and all of a sudden you sort of, before you know it, it's three or four miles gone. And you think, did I just drive that? Was that, was that me? And it happened. And Jesus is saying this, I think he said, he said, you need to stay alert, you need to be aware because his return could be at any time. It does seem clear, it does seem clear that this is a separate event to the, appear, uh, to the appearing of Jesus in verses 24 through 31. 
this is the time when Jesus will return. He says this. He says there's some difference, there's some distance, there's some differences. He gave some signs and some various things that were happening, but this one, in verse 24 through in these last verses, 32 through 37, no signs are given. No signs are given. It's going to be sudden, it's going to be without warning. He gives that story of the master who goes away. And the, the, he gave the workers the responsibility of keeping after the work, looking after the house, all those kind of things. And they said, that we never know the, the, the time of the day, the time of the day that the master may return. Maybe at midnight, maybe in morning, all these sorts of things. He says, only God knows. Only God knows. Now, if you are a student of the Bible, and I hope everybody is here, you say, okay, Eric, you honor, you're on about Jesus being God. So how is it that only the Father knows? And Jesus said that the angels don't know. That's fine because the angels aren't God. But not the Son, but only the Father. Well, how could the Father know something that the Son doesn't know? If, Jesus, if, God is, if the Father is God and Jesus is God, how does that work? That's a good question. And this is why some of the debates happened over history about who is Jesus. And let me just try to answer that real quick. Just because Jesus says that only the Father knows, I remain very strong that Jesus is God. But remember that when Jesus came, he took on human clothes. He took on human flesh. And it's certainly, see, we see many times throughout the Bible that it's almost like, almost like Jesus covered or he veiled his godness temporarily. And it doesn't mean that Jesus ever stopped being God, but the Bible does say that he grew in stature physically and in wisdom. Isn't that interesting to think about? Try to get your head around Jesus hungered. He had all those human attributes as well. So there are times and places that Jesus shows his God nature, but other times it's almost like it's hidden. Doesn't mean that Jesus ever stopped being God, but almost like it was hidden at times. And I think this is one of those times when Jesus says, that only the Father knows. Not that Jesus said, okay, I'm going to suspend my godness for right now. No. But he recognizes that in some incredible way that we struggle to understand how that God and man came together. And this has been a struggle to try and get our head around how that works. But it works. Now, we're going to bring this now to a close. Our job. What is our job? And we are given our job. Number one is to be alert. Is to be alert. Eric, does that mean I should have a bag packed for Jesus returning at any time? Don't worry about the bag. Okay? You won't be taken with you anyway. Okay? Just be aware. And, you know, this little, you know, we've mentioned this little bracelet. It's no longer in vogue, no longer popular, but there was a day when little people would wear these little, you know, believers wear these little thing on their, on their wrist, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Do you remember that some years ago? And that's a good reminder that helps us to be alert. I mean, am, if, if for whatever you're doing at any time of the day, at any day of the week or any, any week of the month, if Jesus were to return at that moment, would God be happy? Would you be embarrassed? Eric, you trying to make me feel guilty? No, no. But remember, every time I have a finger pointed out, how many finger are pointing back at me? At least three. Okay? So this is something that I need to be aware of. I'm not trying to make us fearful. I'm not trying to make us feel guilty. The point is, we need to realize, and Jesus said three times in that section, be alert, be on the watch. Realize that Jesus may return at any moment. It could be midnight. 
It could be in the morning, it could be at tea time, it could be at dinner. Well, that's a whole other debate about what we're going to call meal times. We're not going to get into that right now, okay? Any meal of the day, whether you're getting up in the morning or going to bed at night, Jesus, Jesus said he could come back at any time of the day. And our job is this. Our job is to be about the master's business. That's what our job is. And for you specifically, what does that mean? That means about that whatever God has called, whatever God has put on your heart to be about the master's business, whatever your job is in the master's house, looking at Jesus' as example, that's what we should be doing. So that when Jesus comes back, he can say, well done, good and faithful servant. We had a neighbor. Uh, he's no longer there, but uh, he was a, he actually helped out a lot with Homescar here for a number of years. But he was a, one of these, he was a joiner, but he could put his hands to almost anything. And almost anything. And I helped him on a number of things, and he helped us with a drive and fence and all kinds of things back in the early days of the house. And uh, really, really good, good, good chappy. And he struggled with something. He said, Eric, <clears throat> I've tried to grow the business. The problem is this. He said, I just can't find anyone, a laborer, a helper, who I could teach, who could show up reliably who will come and do the job so I don't have to fear that if I leave the job and say, I need you to shift this gravel from here over to where we're building over there, I need you to shift it while I go and price another job. He said, he said someone would work out for a week or two, but then they would get tired and say, I don't want to do the job anymore. And he said, I get so frustrated. He said, I just, I've just given up. I'm trying to find someone who's reliable. And is that who we are as people? Can, are we reliable to God? Are, if God was looking around for people who would be faithful workers in his house, is God having the same problem that this joiner had? And I think that's a, that's a challenge and a question to each one of us. Are we about the master's business? Are we alert Regardless of any of the details that will be happening, God has it to hand. I'm not worried about it. And my focus, the energies that I have, as the bones keep creaking and the birthdays keep mounting up, that I want to have whatever time, whatever energy that I have to focus on whatever God has called me to do. That's what I want to do. I want to be alert. I want to be about the master's business. And Jesus finishes as now he gets ready to celebrate the Passover with the disciples as he faces the cross. I do find it interesting that that is literally the last real talk, the last real message he gives before he faces the cross.